Hey everyone, welcome to the second half of Season 3 of Ancient DOS Games. Now before we actually get started with today's episode, I just want to show you guys something. This here is the manual for today's game. And one of the first things you're probably thinking is, why in the world is it spiral bound? This thing is freaking huge! I mean seriously, this manual is over 250 pages big. <sighs> And you might be thinking to yourself, well, it can't all be that bad. Like, I mean, it's probably just a bunch of story information, background details about all the objects in the game and stuff. But no, you need to know at least half of the information in this manual if you intend to survive or even just know what the heck you're supposed to be doing. You know, flight simulators are one of the hardest games to get sold. And I think you just got your reason why. <laughs> Today's Ancient DOS game is Advanced Tactical Fighters, often simply called ATF for short, or Jane's ATF because almost all the information and content in this game comes from publications made through the Jane's Information Group. This game has not aged well at all, and even when it first came out, it had questionable graphical fidelity and a simulation model that just plain feels wrong. But at the same time, this game has a massive amount of content. Actually, let me rephrase that. It has a massive quantity of vehicles and objects, which can be put to use towards making plenty of user-based content. See, this is a game that focuses more on quantity instead of quality. The flight simulation model feels wrong because it's having to accommodate several dozen different aircraft, all of which have dramatically different flight properties, yet they all need to work within the same game engine. That's not exactly an easy thing to pull off. The other thing too is that if you dig deep enough into the content this game offers, it actually kind of feels unfinished, as though certain aspects simply didn't get tested enough or that there wasn't enough communication between the programmers and the content creators to ensure everything would gel together properly. All that said though, from a purely nostalgic standpoint, this thing was really fun to play back when it was brand new, simply because of all the experimentation you could do, pitting different kinds of aircraft against each other and using different kinds of ordnance in different situations to see what outperformed what. This is one of those games where nostalgia remembers the game a lot more fondly compared to how good it actually was. So if you have fond memories of this thing, you might want to stop watching now before I start deconstructing it. Advanced Tactical Fighters was created and released by Electronic Arts in 1996 under the Jane's Combat Simulations branding and is a 1-8 player combat flight simulator. It supports a wide array of 256 color video modes from VGA 320x200 all the way up to SVGA 1024x768. However, the cockpit overlays only work up to 800x600, so that's typically the best resolution to play the game at, especially since the information panels you can pull up in-game get really tiny at 1024x768. For sake of recording footage though, everything you're seeing now was recorded at 640x480 resolution. It also supports multiple sound and music devices, including the AdLib Gold of all things, though you'll probably just want to stick with the game's Sound Blaster 16 support. As for its current release date, it's still commercial, but not too difficult to find online from places like Amazon and eBay, so long as you're not being picky over which version you get, as there was a gold release in 1997 which included the NATO Fighters Expansion Pack. The gold edition is typically easier to find than the original, but either way you can expect to pay around $5-$7 to $7 for just the disc, or $30 plus if you want it fully boxed. Yeah, this is one of those cases, probably thanks in part to the huge manual the game comes with, where a fully boxed copy is worth a lot more than just the CD. My copy is the original release, and I don't own the NATO Fighters expansion. 
I should also point out that there was another game called Advanced Tactical Fighter, not plural, that was released in the late 80s for computer systems other than the PC. But since that game is a lot more rare than this one, you probably won't run into it. Just keep the difference between fighter and fighters in mind when you go searching for this game. ATF is what's typically referred to as a combat flight simulator, as opposed to just a regular flight simulator, because you're typically flying high-performance aircraft that are armed to the teeth with guns and missiles, making for a very different experience to a typical flight simulator without armaments, where the goal would simply be to just enjoy the flying experience. Here, you not only need to know how to fly a plane, you need to understand the weapon systems and how they work too, so that you can actually accomplish your mission objectives. However, if you've played other early military simulation games from Electronic Arts, such as LHX Attack Chopper, a game I intend to get to sooner or later, you're going to feel right at home with some of the interfaces, as a lot of them are the same and sort of take the game out of its pure simulation level to make it more accessible to the average person. One of the big ways the game does this is with video tracking of selected targets, showing you a visual window of your selected target including its name, its position, even details about what the AI is doing with it. It's not exactly something you get in a real cockpit. Now, I mentioned before the importance of all the information in the manual, but I should clarify that a really big portion of the manual actually goes into the basics of flight principles, combat maneuvers, the operation of weapon systems, and even the basics of flying, such as how planes generate lift, how to take off, how to land, and those kinds of things. The reason you need to read the manual, though, is because of the controls. Many of the keys on the keyboard actually do something, and I'm not about to explain every little control the game has to offer. This is very much a simulation first and a game second, so jumping into this thing without having played other flight simulators could easily get you killed. To that end, I'm not going to go in depth into the simulation models in place here, though I do have a couple things to say about them. Firstly, as I've already mentioned, the simulation model is incredibly generalized in order to support the massive array of aircraft available. While the game normally only allows for a limited number of aircraft to be flown by the player, a patch was released not too long after which added the ability for the player to fly absolutely any plane the game had to offer, just without the cockpit overlays. To that end, none of the planes in this game feel like they control exactly the way they should. In fact, you'll notice that the controls tend to overcompensate and then readjust when you're done turning in a particular direction, making it incredibly difficult to aim your guns or fly in the exact direction you want to. The other thing about the simulation that doesn't quite feel right at all, and part of the reason why this game became outdated so incredibly quickly, is because of the landscapes. The textures are super pixelated, with minimal perspective correction and virtually no hills, valleys, or other terrain elements. For an early flight sim from the late 80s or early 90s, this would be fine, but this game came out in 1996. Terminal Velocity was released a year prior and that game proved you could have much stronger outdoor environments and still maintain a decent frame rate. It's just another reason why I feel this game wasn't actually finished, considering the technology was clearly present to make more detailed landscapes than this. In terms of actually playing the game, there's thankfully some very strong joystick capabilities with full throttle and rudder support that works with minimal setup effort. So while the game doesn't feel like a proper simulation, the controls are at least very responsive and easy to get set up with devices other than the keyboard. Mid-mission, you're also able to click on things with the mouse, which you'll do to interact with various status windows you can pull up, or to visually target things, which kind of makes up for the lack of having proper MFDs and detailed cockpits, but again, just kind of goes to show the emphasis on quantity over quality. The only other general thing to mention really is that the game has a very simple user interface that you'll use to navigate around to various parts of the program. You can perform single missions, run campaigns of multiple missions strung together where you also need to divert man hours into repairing damaged aircraft, set up quick missions to rapidly experiment with different settings and armaments, look up details about the aircraft featured in the game, and also look up extensive details about many of the game's other elements such as naval vessels, missile weapons, helicopters, and a whole bunch of other things. Granted, all this information present is about 20 years old now, but for its time, this was an amazing huge source of info on real military technology. The reason the game's called Advanced Tactical Fighters is because the specific highlight of the game is seven highly experimental or advanced aircraft, two bombers, five fighters, all of which were special in some way. 
Going through the player aircraft reference in-game will actually provide you with tons of information about these particular aircraft. But of course, because of how old this game is now, much of the information is out of date, to the point where one of the aircraft featured is itself a bit of a mystery. Though really not a huge one, and we'll get to it. It'd take a while to go in depth into all seven of these aircraft, so I'm just going to list them off and mention what's special about them. The two bombers include the Northrop Grumman B-2 Spirit Stealth Bomber and the Lockheed F-117A Nighthawk. The B-2 is one of the stealthiest and most heavily armed aircraft ever produced, and they're still in active service today for those reasons. The F-117A is a much older stealth bomber designed more so for precision strikes given its small payload capacity. They stayed in service for about 25 years and left active service in 2008. Out of the five fighters, only two of them were actual aircraft entering production when this game was produced, the Lockheed Martin F-22A Raptor and the Dassault Rafale C. The F-22A is considered one of the most powerful fighter jets ever produced, and this comes across very well in-game. Mind you, it's also been one of the most expensive ever produced, too. The Rafale C, on the other hand, is highly advanced from a software standpoint, minimizing the number of tasks pilots need to perform so they can stay focused on getting things done, and providing a special automated defensive system to help keep pilots from getting shot out of the sky. But because of how generalized this game is, neither of these aspects of the Rafale really come across to the player. The next two aircraft include the Grumman X-29 and the Rockwell MBB X-31. These were both technology demonstrators, with the X-29 being designed with forward swept wings in order to increase maneuverability, and the X-31 being given an advanced thrust vectoring system to allow it an unprecedented level of control, including the ability to fly at ridiculous angles of attack. While being able to fly these jets in this game is kind of neat, their inclusion is odd since both the X-29 and X-31 projects ended before this game was released, and no production aircraft were ever spawned from them. Finally, we have the extremely odd entry, the Lockheed X-32 Ghost Hawk. Now, this one's going to take a bit of an explanation, because if you go looking up details about this thing, you're not going to find any. Instead, you're going to find information about the Boeing X-32 and the Lockheed Martin X-35, which ultimately became the F-35 Lightning II. In 1993, a multinational program called the Joint Advanced Strike Technology Program was created, eventually becoming the Joint Strike Fighter Program, with the end goal being to develop a fighter aircraft that could address numerous shortcomings in the current fleet of aircraft and produce a fighter that could serve a multitude of roles for a multitude of military organizations. Two of the companies that ended up in fierce competition to produce a jet for this program were Boeing and Lockheed Martin. One of the primary goals of this program was that the aircraft needed to be Stovall capable, Stovall being an acronym for Short Takeoff and Vertical Landing, a capability primarily desired by Navy organizations looking to operate the jet from aircraft carriers. Very early in this program, before any official designations were released, Lockheed Martin had produced various informational pieces to demonstrate their ideas towards this project, and in these informational pieces they had created a mock aircraft known internally as the X-32 Ghost Hawk, which was used primarily just to give context towards the type of technologies they were going to employ. So yeah, the X-32 in this game is primarily based around very early information coming out of Lockheed Martin along with the overarching goals the project was aiming towards. When the official designations were finally given out to Boeing and Lockheed Martin's projects, Boeing got the X-32 designation and Lockheed Martin got X-35. To the game's credit, if you go through its information sections, it knows the X-32 was still incredibly early in its design phase, and even shows Boeing's conceptual details which actually translated through to the real X-32 fairly well. The X-32 in this game, though, is nothing like the real X-32, nor is it even like the F-35 Lightning II, which is what Lockheed Martin eventually produced from all this. One thing that's clear right from the get-go is that this game was developed with user-made content in mind, at least as far as single missions are concerned. To that end, you're able to create and play what's referred to as Pro Missions, created using the game's built-in mission editor. While this editor can be a little clunky to use at times, it's actually pretty straightforward. You simply select various settings for things like locations and weather, then add in objects and give them various properties, such as who's piloting them, AI skill, mission objectives, etc. 
It does take a bit to get used to the editor though, since just like in real life, every object you add needs to serve some kind of purpose and have some kind of objective. When you create an enemy aircraft, for instance, you need to give them mission goals, waypoints, and even threat responses such as whether to attack, defend, evade, or ignore specific kinds of hostile targets. If you intend to allow the user to see the operational map for the mission prior to playing the game, you also need to define which objects you've added can be seen by the player on this map and which can't. While the process for creating a custom mission can be rather intimidating and time-consuming, it actually works fairly well. And you can add in all the extra flair you want by creating text files to go with your missions, including briefing details and other such things. You can essentially create entire campaigns of missions, though I'm unsure if it's actually possible to make custom campaigns. If it is possible, it's not obvious how to do it, nor is there any official information on the process. One last thing to talk about is the unfinished state this game appears to be in. While this may not come as a surprise considering the company that released it, people who have played this game in the past may be wondering how in the world I'm drawing this conclusion. It's a little tricky to explain, but it should make sense once I'm done. Firstly, the game's programmers and the game's content creators clearly weren't on the same page. A great example of this is with the missions where you fly the F-117A. That particular aircraft can only equip two bombs at a time, but many of the missions you fly it on has more than two targets to take out, meaning the content creators probably figured that, given the explosive force of the bombs being loaded, they could have more than two targets as long as they were close enough together. But every bomb in this game has the exact same explosion radius. Yeah, 2,000 pound bombs in this game have no more of a blast radius than a 500 pound bomb. Secondly, the game includes three maps you can use for creating custom missions but only two of them are actually used in the campaigns. Considering how much effort went into setting up airfields on each map, it almost seems as though a third campaign was planned, but the developers simply ran out of time before they could get it made. Thirdly, the flight model is definitely unfinished, and a great example of this is when you're attempting to land. The thing is, you don't normally have to ever land your plane in this game, as the game will consider a mission successful so long as objectives are met and your plane is inside friendly territory when you quit the simulation. To that end, the landing process was clearly not tested all too well, and while landing a plane is normally one of the most difficult things you can do in a flight simulator of any kind, much less real life, it's surprisingly easy in this game for the wrong reasons. You can be unlevel, unstraight, going way too slow, but you'll find that unless you pretty much completely cut your engines, you're never going to get the plane down. And once you do get it down, you'll be completely stopped in just a few seconds. Again, very much unlike real life. Vertical landings are also bugged up with the jets that can accomplish it, since in real life it takes a huge amount of thrust to pull this off. But in this game, only 10% throttle is typically enough, and any more will just shoot you up into the air. Lastly, there's no spin-outs. Ever. It's supposed to be possible, especially considering the nature of some of the planes, but I have never once entered an uncontrolled spin in the countless hours I've played this game for when it was still new. So either I'm a better pilot than I realize, or the game simply doesn't properly implement this part of the flight model. Wow, this turned into a surprisingly long episode. It kind of goes to show the kind of game Advanced Tactical Fighters is. It's more of an encyclopedia of information related to advanced aircraft and related military hardware than a simulator that feels like it's adequately giving an impression of how these jets are piloted. Given that all the information presented here is horribly out of date too, what we've ended up with in the long run is a game that doesn't really give a good impression anymore of the stuff it's presenting and never played that well to begin with. Now don't get me wrong, this thing was fun to play back when it was new, despite its shortcomings. But as I said right from the start, this thing went for quantity over quality, and nowadays is more interesting as a piece of DOS gaming history than as something worth going back to and actually playing. While the game's mostly simple to set up in DOSBox, there is one small hiccup, and it has to do with the movies you can play back in-game. Basically, none of the movies presented playback properly if the cycles count is even remotely high. But to get a decent frame rate, you need to play with the max cycle setting. So essentially, before starting the game, you need to choose whether you're going to watch the in-game movies or actually play the game. If you're going to watch the movies, set cycles to 20,000 to get them to play back properly. Otherwise, if you're going to play the game, set cycles to max. 
Also, you not only want to set the joystick into CH flight stick mode in order to be able to use both its rudder and throttle support, but you also want to make sure timed intervals are on. Yes, this is actually another game that doesn't control properly with the joystick if timed intervals are off, much to my surprise. So make sure you double check that. I also recommend creating an ISO of your CD and image mounting it in DOSBox to cut down on loading times. Although to be honest, this only really affects movie playback. Anywho, that's all for today's episode of Ancient DOS Games. Next week for episode 127, we're going to take a look at a game that actually plays back digitized sounds of birds chirping and frogs croaking over the PC speaker of all things. Heck, some of you might actually be able to figure this one out without even knowing anything about the game itself, so make sure you send in your guests to ADG at PickleShips.com and stay tuned as we push forwards with another year of DOS gaming greatness.